Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Nitha Ramachandra from the NR Hour Sports Show. This is episode 950. Um, we are live on Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Anchor. Everyone, please tune in. We are we're joined by a really special guest. His name is Dwayne Clemens. He's a former NFL def defensive end. He went to California for college. He played for the Minnesota Vikings, Kansas City Chiefs, Cincinnati Bengals, and he also played in the Canadian Football League, which we'll, we're going to talk about that also, his career, his journey, how he got into football. And after his NFL career, he's a, he's a co-founder of Urban, Urbana's and Spine and Wellness. Uh, really inspired by that. I'm, re I'm really looking forward to learn more of, the, of that program you, you run and you're, you're the co-founder of. But first of all, uh, Dwayne, I just want to say thank you for joining the show. We finally made this happen. And uh, how are you and your family doing today? Um, but my family is doing great. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So I want to start off with your childhood. Childhood growing up as a kid, you grew, you grow, you grew up in California. And uh, when did you get interested in the game of football? And uh, who would you say your role, uh, your biggest role model uh, that you looked up to? Um, I, well, I loved sports my whole life, and I didn't really get a chance to play organized sports until high school. But, you know, just playing in the neighborhood and, you know, just, you know, being in summer camp, you know, obviously that was the thing we do. I was an outside kid. We played football, basketball, every sport you can think of. But the first time I actually got on a football field and put on pads was in high school. And, you know, where I was from, there wasn't a lot of opportunities to, to, to make it out of. And, you know, there was a couple of kids that had played before me that had got scholarships. So I dared to dream that I could uh, get one, too, after seeing a couple of guys matriculate through through the football program at my local high school. But Lawrence Taylor was probably hmm. my biggest hero. He, uh, I, you know, I still remember the first time I ever actually watched football TV and I just saw this man cussing and spitting and screaming. And I was just like, in the back of my mind, I was like, man, that is a bad dude. Yeah. And everybody was talking about him. And I was like, man, I want to be like that guy. <laughs> you know, kind of that's how, that was always in the back of my mind every time I stepped on a football field. Uh, yeah, he obviously a great player to learn from. And I actually had his former teammate on the show, uh, Leonard Marshall. I had him on the show and uh, I did oh, an interview, yeah, I did an in-person interview with Leonard and uh, that was an honor. And uh, obviously his former teammate with Lawrence Taylor. But uh, what a great, great player, legendary player to learn from, though. So I'm actually close friends with one of his college teammates. And he was also one of my clients, Mike. I don't know if you remember Mike Wilshire. Oh, no. Uh, he played. San Diego played with Lawrence Taylor at North Carolina. Uh, he actually retired in the in, here in the DMV, and uh, he's been a client of mine. So we've had a lot of fun stories. He actually got Lawrence Taylor to sign an autographed jersey for wow. me at a picture. So yeah. thanks, Mike, if you're out there listening. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. So um, in your high school, um, obviously uh, now in this generation, uh, coaches love to play players uh, multiple positions so they can learn uh, different aspects of the game. For you. Before deciding on defensive end, did you did you get to play any other positions in high school? Yes, in high school, I actually played both ways. I was a two-way starter. I was I was actually offered scholarships at both tight end and defensive end. So um, I pretty much got to Cal, and you know, my coach said, "Here, I, I, you know, it's kind of up to you." But he did say he he did happen to mention like defensive alignment make more money. So I thought about it, and I chose defense. <laughs> Yeah, so um, what were the main things that you learned in high school, uh, especially senior year? Uh, that's the most important year when all the scholarships come in. And what, what were the main things that you learned as a player in high school? Um, well, you know, for me, probably the hardest thing was how to deal with this whole other world. You know, we didn't have the Internet. We didn't have, you know, cell phones. We didn't have 24-hour media. So yeah. when I was in high school, you all of a sudden went from just being a normal kid in high school to now you have you know, household names knocking on your door, sending you recruiting letters, asking you to come on trips. And, you know, I, I remember being just kind of overwhelmed by all the attention and also just being, you know, completely out of my element, going to these five-star restaurants and, mm -hmm. you know, you know, not even having the kind of clothes to wear to a place like this and, you know, feeling like a little bit insecure about you know, kind of by everything, you know, where I live, I'm, I'm living in a two bedroom apartment and, you know, low income housing. And, you know, these people are coming to my house every weekend. It's like, you know, I, I'm embarrassed to even get my glass of water because, you know, our tap water, you know, you got to let it settle first. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so 
it, it, it's kind of overwhelming to come from very humble means and then all of a sudden be thrust into this world and it's like you know you have to learn and try to pick up quick and you know everybody's coming from a place of you know they're, they're coming off as, as that they're doing you a favor yeah you know oh we're going to give you a scholarship we're going to give you this we're going to give you this but there's really nobody there to educate you and kind of put it really in perspective for you. It's like, no, they're not going to give you anything. You're going to come here. You're not going to have any money. You're going to be broke for four years. You're going to work your butt off. And if you're really good, you might have the opportunity to play for money on Sundays. But the four years that you're here, you're going to basically come and work your butt off and you're not going to have anything to show for it other than if you graduate, which, you know, I, I think it's kind of a little bit of a misconception. You know, they kind of, you know, you, you come from this world, you think, oh, my life is going to be changed. But it was like, shoot, I struggled more in college than I did, you know, growing up, you know, being a, in a single parent household. So, you know, that's that's the one thing. If I could go back, I wish I understood that that dynamic. I lived off of $700 a month in the Bay Area in, in, in the 90s. And it was just like, you know, that's, that's kind of like the existence that you don't realize that you're actually getting into when they're coming to your house recruiting you for that day. Wow. Yeah, so... Uh... For you, uh, how important was it for you to learn the offensive side of the game and the defensive side at the same time? And what would you say to players now that that are playing uh, the offense and defense at the same at the same time? And how important was it for you? Well, for me, it became well, once I got to college. You know, it was a total shift to defense. But the best thing about me on defense was I felt like what made me mark was the players that I played every position. I started at both inside linebacker, outside linebacker. I could play three technique. I could play one technique. I could play both ends, left end and right end equally. And so when I look at every team I played on, especially once I got to the NFL, mm -hmm. we always say the more you can do, the, the, the longer you'll have a job in the NFL. And I, and, I, and I really do think the longevity I had the 10 years was because I could play every single position. I, I could stand up and play rush from two, two feet. I could put my hand on the ground. I could rush inside, outside. And I was pretty much equally as good on both sides. I didn't have a fall off to where it's like, oh my God, we can't move him over here. We can't move him over there. If somebody got hurt, I could immediately shift to that side, to the opposite side and, and be just as comfortable as, as a position that I practiced all week to play. Oh, wow. Yeah, so now uh, moving forward to your college recruitment process, tell our fans, what was that like? And you got to stay home in California. And how many offers did you get outside of California? And how how tough was the choice? And um, how long did it take you to choose? But what was it, what was it like once you saw, uh, committed to California? Well, you know, I think it, the hard, that was, and that was like probably the hardest part. It's kind of like the first time all of a sudden every girl in school wants to talk to you all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah. and it's like all of a sudden all these schools are calling you. Everybody's asking for my trip. So I took my recruiting trips to UNLV. I, went, I took my recruiting trip to Colorado State. Uh, I went to Cal. I got offered trips to Arizona. Um, I went down to USC for an unofficial, UCLA for an unofficial because they were right down the street. Um, but when it came down to it, the degree at Cal was the biggest decider for me. Um, I knew that I knew that at the end of the day, football was a long shot. So to me, to, to get that number one institution and number one public institution degree from University of California was uh, definitely by far my most important decision coming out to say, hey, like, listen, at least I got you know, degree from a reputable school, this shit opened some doors for me. And it definitely did, even even, even beyond what my NFL career did for me. Hmm. So uh, obviously, what was it like for you, the experience like playing at California, staying home, uh, so you have, so you can have your friends and family come to the games? And what was the atmosphere like in California for you, in the college? Well, you know, California is a big state. So I grew up in Southern California, Riverside. So it's still about a five-hour you know, five hour ride from Riverside up to the Bay Area. So unfortunately I can't say I felt like I was playing in front of my 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 friends very often. But you know, I consider the Bay Area home now. But you know, I think my mom might have been able to drive up to a handful of games. But for the most part I kinda had to play even if it felt like it was going out of state for my friends and family to drive all the way up. But uh the few times that it did happen it was a lot more fun when I went down and played at USC and UCLA. Yeah. Those actually felt like home games for me because like literally I'd have 30 or 40 people show up for those games because it was only a, a 45 minute ride versus the five hour ride. Plus they got to get a hotel and stay up at Cal and then, you know, plus the five hours back. So um, it was always fun. And even in the NFL, the same thing. I loved coming home, playing in San Diego, playing against the 49ers, playing against Oakland, 
you know, anytime I was in California, it was always a beautiful feeling to, to step on that home turf. Yeah. So uh, what do you say playing against like the top colleges in your career got you ready for the NFL? Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, because the, the best thing about it is like being in the Pac-12, you know, I played against Jonathan Ogden every single year. I played against Tony Baselli yeah. like three out of the four years. You know, my my teammates were Tony Gonzalez. My teammates were first round draft picks like, um, uh, shoot, I'm trying to forget guys, Todd Stussy. Um, yeah. So the competition and even on my team, you know, my my book in the same year I came out of the first round was Reagan Upshaw. Mm -hmm. So it was so much talent around us. And I know the Pac-12 doesn't get known as well for being like, you know, yeah. you know, the, the the powerhouse conference. But when I when you put out players and you start looking across, looking at the draft and you start looking at players that have longevity and especially start looking at the Hall of Fame, you'll see the Pac-12 puts in a, a, lot, a lot of quality. We don't put out the quantity of other conferences, but the quality of players that we put out is, is you know, as far as I'm concerned, second to none. Because, we, I mean, when I, when I think of every single week, I played against somebody that's in the NFL. Hmm. Yeah, so speaking of Jonathan Ogden, uh, obviously you got to play against him in the NFL also. And what was it like going against him uh, throughout your career? And also, actually, I had a brother on the show, Marcus Ogden. I had, uh, he was on the show too. But what was it like going against Jonathan Ogden? You know, it's so cool when you kind of go through a progression with a guy. And it's just like, when I got to Cal, I started as a true freshman. When he got to UCLA, he started as a true freshman. So, you know, it's kind of cool when you start to remember, like, hey, we were pups. And, you know, we were nodding at each other, didn't have no teeth, and then we're sophomores, and then juniors, and then, you know, it's like, wow, now we're at the draft together. And we actually ended up being at the draft together and, oh. and being in New York. And I, I still have pictures, you know, probably in a, up on this wall somewhere of me and him sitting there the day before the draft, going past the Twin Towers in New York on a ferry, yeah. just hanging out with uh, Eddie George. And, wow. and, and I mean, so many other guys, Keyshawn Johnson, um, Tim Bianca Batuka, mm. all these guys, and we're all just pups waiting for opportunity to get into the NFL the next day. And then to go to, like, oh, now, we're, now I've been to the Hall of Fame and seen these yeah. guys matriculate into their post careers. And to think, like, man, we were just babies. Like, I, was, I still remember being, you know, 17, eight, I mean, 19, 18, 19 years old and stepping across that white stripe for the first time playing Division One football to now we've played 10 plus years of NFL football to now. We're 10 years out of the NFL and we're still, you know, seeing each other every now and again, and, you know, seeing each other even from afar, still accomplish new goals and, and reach new heights in, in, in our afterlife. So, you know, life is good and you just feel blessed that, you know, you've been in some rarefied company and, and you know, you, you, you've been able to say, hey, I've done some things with some guys that are pretty special. Hey, what a story. That's a story that you can tell your kids uh, throughout the whole life. And uh, what an amazing story there. And uh, speaking Absolutely. of the draft... Yeah, speaking of the draft, tell our fans about your draft experience. Obviously, you got drafted in 96, round one, pick 16 by the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, what was that like for you and your family and well, waiting for your name to be called? And once you got na once you got your name called, how relieved were you? You know, I, and that's probably the one thing I was – I wish I would have just enjoyed the moment more when I look back at it. You know, you have no control over it, but if you can imagine your whole life – being in somebody's hands and you just have no idea, am I going to Green Bay, Wisconsin? Am I going to, am I going down the street to San Diego? You know, and being in the moment, I just felt like I was a ball of nerves and I didn't enjoy it to the fullest. It was just, you know, too, too much to take in all the, you know, the trying to figure it out in my head when I should have just, hey, listen, I just like got to take care of it. I'm gonna go where I'm gonna go. I just need to just enjoy every moment of it and just be be happy. I'm going somewhere, but I, I will say I was just a ball of nerves and I didn't really, I, I, you know, it was just. I still look back and it was just so surreal to be in this like almost feeling like I was in a pressure cooker and everybody was watching me and like waiting for my name to get called. And every time my name didn't get called, I just felt like I was sliding into this abyss. And, you know, 16 is a great thing. But it just seemed like it took so long right. to get there to 16. When you're sitting there thinking like, oh, any moment, like my name might get called. <laughs> my name might be called. My name might get called. And then after a while, you start kind of getting that fear. Like, yeah. God, I know that guy that's not going to get picked. You know, and, and I actually remember that. There was a, what was the guy from Texas Tech? He was a running back. Um, and he didn't get picked that day. Oh. I think he got picked the second day. I remember he just, oh, God, what was his name? 
Um, I just remember he was a running back for Texas Tech. And which draft year? 96. It was the same draft I was in. Oh, wow. But, you know, every year you watch the draft and you see yeah. that guy that goes to the draft and doesn't get picked. Yeah. And I just remember every time the lights, would, the cameras would come by, and, you know, they focus on you for a split second, then they go away. And then it just be like, oh, man, this emotional roller coaster. Like, is it my turn? No, okay. No, okay. Oh, no, they're going down the hall. Okay, no, no, okay, it's not me. And you're just waiting and waiting. And then they finally call your name, and you're almost like, stop playing. You mean it? <laughs> All right. And then it's like, okay, finally it's over with. So then it's like a million pounds of pressure just came off your body. But uh, it, it, was a, it was a gift and a curse. But I wish if I could go back, I would have just really not worried, not been anxious, and not, not have had any anxiety about it. I would have just enjoyed the day and just been like, hey, if I don't get picked to the very last person, I'm, I'm not going to worry about a thing. I'm just going to be be faithful and, and, and happy and not, 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 not put any extra pressure on myself to do something I ain't got no control over. Yeah, so uh, what, what was the first thing you guys did after you got drafted? Well, they immediately, well, there's obviously a bunch of press conferences yeah. and, you know, you go on the floor, take a bunch of pictures and meet a bunch of people. But pretty much they arranged for you to fly out to Minnesota and that was the, i probably say maybe two or three hours after the draft, after I drafted, I was on a plane in Minnesota and doing press conferences. And, uh, I think the first thing I remember is I did this, it was April, but in Minnesota in April, it was still pretty brisk. So it was probably maybe, I would say high 40s and they had a nice little wind. And there was still like like a few little snow banks, like, you know, uh, off in the distances. And of course they want to do an interview with you as soon as you come off the plane. And I just remember thinking like, it's kind of brisk, this is April. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, so we sit there, we do the interview and I was like, okay, I'm ready to go inside now. Like, and everybody was like, oh man, it's a beautiful day out here. That's why we wanted to kind of set up out here. And I was like, oh man, these people, I was thinking to myself, like, oh, these people are crazy. It's like, it's 40 degrees where it looks like, and it's windy out here. I'm like, this is, I'm from California. I got a windbreaker. Like, this ain't, <laughs> this ain't a pretty day to me. <laughs> yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So when you go, when you, now when you get, get into the white Vikings team and you see players like Warren Moon, Chris Carter, and you got to play with John Handel, one of the great defensive ends too in the league. Uh, so what, what, what goes through your mind as a rookie when you see players like that, when you're walking in? Well, that was the, probably the greatest experience in the world. Like, you know, being number 92, they put me right next to John Randall. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I walk in the locker room and I see my nameplate and I see John Randall next to me. And I had already gotten a chance to talk to Warren Moon because we had the same agent. So we had talked a little bit. And, you know, it was kind of like a little bit of being starstruck. You know, when I got to Minnesota, we were a team of superstars. Randy Moss, Chris Carter, um, John Randall, Randall McDaniel, Chris Dolman was there. Um, I mean, it was almost like the who's who at almost any position you could think of at some point. Robert Smith. Yeah. Um, even when I watch TV now, I still see like half the guys that I play with are still in journalism. Yeah. You know, it was just so so prolific. And and, and I and I guess who my ball boy was, Larry Fitzgerald. Larry Fitzgerald. Yeah, his dad was a beat writer for Minnesota. Larry Fitzgerald used to watch my car. Wow. In training camp, I used to, you know, let him take my ride. He used to take the keys and get my car washed up. And while well, I let him keep it for a couple of days. But, yeah, he did a great job. The kid was – he was an awesome kid. I, I remember him being a young guy coming around with his dad. And I trusted him with, with all my, my – <laughs> at, at that time was my big-time brand-new Lincoln Navigator with the, the first year it ever came out. And wow. you know, he used to take good care of it and keep it clean. And I'm sure he had plenty of good times showing off in it. That's crazy. I, that's crazy. I didn't know about that. Uh, but now, so what was it like actually learning from uh, John Randall and obviously a great person to learn from, great player? And what were the, what kind of – tell our fans, what experience did you share with them as a player, as a teammate on the field and off the field? Well, you know, probably the greatest thing about playing John Randall is you had absolutely no other choice but to get better every single day. You're talking about a man who whose work ethic and whose whose level of tolerance for mediocrity was zero. And you know, Johnny was our coach. You know, when I first got to me as a D line, Johnny was the coach. I mean, we did what Johnny did. We worked as hard as Johnny worked. And Johnny never got tired. Johnny never stopped working. Johnny was he was the most brutally honest person ever in, in, in the world. So when you watch film with Johnny, 
there was not going to be any punches for it. Your feelings was going to get hurt. So you better play completely awesome because Johnny never lost a rep. Johnny Johnny didn't get beat. Johnny got double teamed and triple teamed. So if you're over there, we, we used to have this saying called SOL, stuck on the line. Yeah. If you're over there getting blocked by one guy, you know, Johnny can <laughs> ring for that because he's fighting two guys, three guys, and still going out there making plays. So, you know, you, you don't want to be SOL, stuck on the line. And then Johnny had a way of just communicate, man. He would hurt your soul. You know, you feel like smaller than, than small could even be imagined because you see me like, man, I'm a 300 pound grown man who could bench 500 pounds, but I ain't gonna say nothing to this man who's talking real crazy to me right now. And he wish I would stand up and actually and think I was gonna do something about it. And then you sitting there like, yes, your son, and no, sir. And you just understand like your place in the pecking order. He was the big dog. And you know, if you got put in your place, it wasn't about him putting you in your place. You just wanted to. You wanted to, to make sure that every time you walked in that film, he had nothing to say to you. So it just made brought out the best in you as a player because you knew you knew what was waiting for you. If you didn't go out there and ball, or even in practice, if you went out there, because we watched every single rep, every single film, you got your butt kicked in practice. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you was going to hear about it. He was going to back that film up. He was going to rewind it. And look at this right here. Look at your effort. Look at you getting stuck on it. He was going to break down everything you did wrong. So he was coaching you, but he was going to hurt your feelings in the worst way. And you was gonna, you were never going to forget every lesson he taught you because it was going to hurt your soul the way he, he paraded you and, and made you feel like, like a very small human being. He was like, that nothing going on the field. But knowing that you had to watch that on film with Johnny two or three more times possibly was even worse because you'd have to watch it in the individual. You'd have to watch it in defense. And sometimes, you know, we didn't watch film together as a team. And that would be even worse because he didn't help back. I hope you who was in the room. Mm, wow. Yeah. So uh, tell what was it like playing in Minnesota in general? And uh, obviously the fan base, they have a great fan base and school. Uh, they do the school chants, the school. So what, what was it like playing in front of the fans there? Oh, man. Well, they always say that Minnesotans are the nicest people. Yeah. And I, I will say it was it's almost weird how nice they are and how friendly they were. But we had such a good time there. I mean, we won some of the games. We went 15-1 one year. We, we made the playoffs every single year. Synergistically, I think our fan base loved us as much as anybody could love our fans. I, I don't feel like there was nothing our fan base would do for us. I don't remember paying for very many meals. I don't remember ever not feeling supported. I don't ever remember, like, <clears throat> like I said, if I, almost anything, any place I went in Minnesota, we got treated with absolute reverence. And so... I, I will say, if I ever felt like a rock star, it was, it was those four years in Minnesota because they were just so appreciative and they just were so into it. And, and like I said, we went out there with this kind of almost this air of knowing we were going to win. It was just a matter of about how much. We were so good and so dominant at that point that, you know, it was just fun. It was just like, okay, we're going to probably at least win by two or three touchdowns. Or, you know, oh, this might be a tough game. We might win only by like nine points. But it was never a question in our minds, like, what are we going to win? It was like, no, nah, we're going to dominate. But it's just like, hey, between two, two at least double-digit win or, or, or maybe less than double digits. Yeah, so um, I got to ask you this. Since you you played tight end in high school, did you get any opportunities in your NFL career to to, to score offensive touchdown or no? I did. Well, I didn't score a touchdown on offense. I scored a touchdown on defense. Yeah, but unfortunately, fortunately, but unfortunately, you know, when, you know, I was always – I was always uh, too important to the defense to, right. to really be spared on offense. And in, in Minnesota, trust me, they didn't need no more help on offense. They had just, <laughs> yeah. Guys getting the ball over there, trying to, <laughs> you know, trying to spread it out between Jake Reed, Randy Moss, Chris yeah. Carter, Robert Smith, Leroy Ord. And, and we had a pretty good tight end, Andrew Glover at the time, who, who, who did a great job for us. So um, and then by the time I got to Cincinnati and Kansas City, I was just – I was so much of the defense that they just couldn't spare me. Yeah, so this is a – speaking of uh, uh, Randy Moss, Chris Carter, and Warren Moon, what was it like going against them in practices uh, alone, uh, getting to go against those three players in practice? Well, that we always had the saying in football, iron sharpens iron. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being in Minnesota, I don't know how – when I look at Minnesota, I kind of look at how Kansas City is today. Yeah. You know, where you, you have this dynamic core of – of players on offense that are just so capable that they bring out the best of you on defense because it puts more pressure on us as a D line because it's like, hey, we got to get the ball out of their hands faster because you know we we already know they'll they you know they only need two or three seconds to get open and then once they're open it could be a touchdown 
So, you know, it put that pressure on us as a defense to play harder and constantly come up with, how do I get to the quarterback a little bit faster? And, you know, when you practice against uh, your own team and they're that good, you know, it only makes you better. So then you get there on Sundays and the game almost seems slow to you because you've been playing against the best player you're going to play all week. Hmm. So this is a two-part question. And uh, what, what would you say uh, what your best moments was as a Viking and your best uh, best game or best moments you, that you uh, that you relieve, relive with the Minnesota Vikings? And the next part to this, do you ever think to yourself, maybe I can spend uh, throughout your the whole career with the Vikings? Let's see. <clears throat> probably if I was to go back to my best moment as a Viking, I'd probably say my last year with the Vikings, with the very last game of the season, and it was actually, I'm sorry, my last regular season game as a Viking, we played the Detroit Lions. And all me, John Randall, and Chris Goldman, all of us had, like, we went into the game, I think I had eight sacks. Doe had, like, eight sacks. Johnny had, like, nine sacks. And we were all trying to get to 10. Right. And so <laughs> you can imagine... Imagine just this feeding frenzy. We go into this game and all of us are just, you know, dying. I was trying to get to double digits. So that game was like, I think we ended up as a group between the three of us, we ended up with like eight sacks. Wow. I think John, I think I ended up with two and a half sacks uh, or one and a half sacks and Joe Dole ended up with a sack and a half and Johnny might've had two sacks. And it was just like that whole game was just a feeding frenzy. Because on top of like having like seven sacks between us, it felt like we hit that quarterback every single play. Oh. So it's like he liked the ball and one of us was on top of him. And it was just like, it wasn't even about them. It was about us three trying to outdo each other. And I remember just feeling like that was the most competitive I've ever been. I'm, I'm battling with two Hall of Famers. And the only race is like, who's going to get to the quarterback first? We weren't even thinking about the guys in front of us, they were like a non-factor. It was just like, how do I be Johnny? How do I be Chris? How do I be Johnny? And then the three of us doing it, and they're just like, oh my God, what are these guys on? It's like, it's like these guys are shot out of a cannon. And it's like, yeah, we're throwing our best moves. We're, we're, we're all fighting with our best effort, all just because we know, hey, we got to beat each other. It ain't, yeah. you know? And that's when you're having the most fun, which is like racist quarterback. So, um, and also, did, did you ever think maybe you could have spent your whole career with one team? Or I would have loved to stay in Minnesota. I think me and Johnny had had one of the greatest dynamic, you know, synergies, you know, especially by the time I played my fourth year with him. But, you know, there were some issues where the, the head coach at the time, he really, from the time I got there, he wanted to be the general manager and he didn't really want me as a player. And so I was kind of forced out of the current general manager. And so... By the time four years that went by, we just didn't have a great relationship working wise. And I just wanted to go somewhere else and start over. And so when Kansas City gave me the opportunity to come there after Derek Thomas passed, I went there and became became like, you know, my best self because I didn't have to deal with the head coach that was, you know, not not in my corner. Yeah. So I'm gonna uh, before we get to your Chiefs career and Bengals career, I wanna put you on the spot here. So which defense now which defense now compares to your defense that you had in Minnesota? Ooh. You know what? I really like New Orleans. New Orleans kind of reminds me of our, of our defense in Minnesota because, you know, we had some really dominant defensive guys up front. We had some of the feistiest guys in the secondary. And it was kind of like they weren't the, like guys like Robert Griffith and Orlando Thomas and, and uh, guys, I'm a, uh, uh, Griffith. I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, gosh, it was another one. Uh, oh. Played at Florida State. I'm seeing the Corey Fuller, and I'm trying yeah. to forget my other corner. But, you know, these guys weren't necessarily the household names. But when I tell you, these guys are just playmakers. You know, you, you might not remember these guys because it was hard for those guys to get Pro Bowls and, right. and get Hall of Fame nods. But when I tell you, they played like it. They played so big. And when I tell you, Robert Griffith and Orlando Thomas – those are two of the greatest safeties that are probably unheralded in the league. They would knock your butt off. They would catch passes. They made big plays. They played. And, and these guys were, I mean, maybe 215 pounds. They were, they were smaller guys, but wow. they could cover and they could play so big. They played like linebackers. Hmm. And, and, and when I tell you, they, they actually had put guys in, put, put the fear of God in guys around the league during that time. Yeah. So now, Throughout moving forward in your career, you got to play with the Kansas City Chiefs and the Cincinnati Bengals, and uh, I know you're excited to talk talk about your Chiefs and the and the Bengals too. But what was it like 
playing for the Kansas City Chiefs throughout your career. And uh, those fans are uh, another great fan base, too, in Kansas City. Absolutely. Well, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> we didn't have quite as much success as they, as they are having now. The first year I got there, we had Gunther Cunningham, and he only got to basically be the head coach for a season. We went 8-8, eight and eight, and then Dick Vermeil came in, and I think we might have went 9-7. and seven. Um, didn't quite make the playoffs both those years. And then my third year, we were with Dick. Uh, I think we struggled to make the play. I think we struggled and missed the playoffs again because of a lot of injuries. Um, we didn't lose. Like, we were always just above 500 or right at 500. But we definitely didn't have the kind of success that I had in Minnesota and was used to going to the playoffs every single year. And and, and obviously, we went through some growing pains because of the coaching change. And, and then I think at one point, uh, yeah, yeah, with coaching change, and then we actually had changed the quarterback and the offense, and then we basically the the entire defense was like completely dismantled. Hmm. Like the second year I got there, so it just I, by the time I got to my third year there, it was like we were we were just constantly in a rebuilding phase. But I believe they kind of got it together the year after I left. Yeah, so uh, now you uh, go to Cincinnati, and uh, you what was it like playing with uh, John Kitna, Chad Johnson? Chad Ochocinco now, but uh, what, what was it like playing in Cincinnati? Well, it was awesome to go to be on, to go there with Marvin Lewis to kind of be on his first inaugural team as a head coach. You know that that meant a lot to me, especially you know seeing him as a as a black head coach who got slighted and kind of got picked over. You know, I, I found it kind of meaningful to kind of be able to spend like my last few years playing for a guy that I felt he understood adversity. He understood what it was like to struggle and have to fight for something and, and be told, hey, you're not good enough because of, you know, whatever reason, but but to know he is and to know he was a good leader and to kind of get a chance to go there and be the first team, the first, I think the first, that was the first winning team the Bengals had in I don't know how many seasons, but all, all three years we had, we had winning seasons and we made it to the playoffs and, and you know, to kind of see that organization kind of make a turn under his, his leadership and to be a part of that first couple teams right. that he uh, had coached, that was amazing. And, you know, playing with Chad was always a lot of fun. You never knew. You know, the great thing is you, you never had to worry about your name being in the headlines for very long because Chad was always going get to get his name in the headlines a little bigger than yours. So, uh, you know, right or wrong, he, he definitely he definitely always had a story or something going on. And, <laughs> so, you know, that locker room was, was always buzzing with, with some kind of drama or, or talk. <laughs> And it was kind of cool being in the city almost where the bar was so low that almost anything you did was like considered greatness. Like, you know, I remember the first year we went eight and eight and I'm looking at myself like, oh my God, that was terrible. And, you know, people were like, hey man, that was cool. Like, you know, we went, we've been two and 15 or two and 14. And, you know, in my mind, I can't even conceive of like, you've lost 12, 13 games. You've had, you've had multiple seasons where you've lost 10 or more games. I have never in my entire career as a football player hmm. had a losing season. And that goes back to high school, Pop Warner. I mean, the worst team I've ever been on was 8-8. Eight and, eight. and to think, like, man, you're a professional football team. To think I'm playing with guys who have been in the league six or seven years and they've never had a winning season. Wow. That first year we went 8-8. Eight and eight. <laughs> That was the first time they could actually even hold their head with any modicum of respect. Like, I was just sitting there like, dang, man, that is – that was, like, that was very uh, surreal for me to be like, Damn, that is sad. Like you guys, you've been here your whole career. Guys like Wendy Anderson, guys like you know yeah. that were like career Bengals, Corey, Corey, De Corey Dillon, you know, going there that first year and be like, man, this is, this is how this is like how struggling. This is what struggle really is to sit there year after year knowing you're gonna get your butt kicked, game in, game out, and then to be so close to winning because I think they might have lost like almost every game by like one point mm. or two points. Yeah, so now actually now the Bengals are having a great season. They're turning around. I'm hoping that I think this is the year they can make the playoffs. Hopefully, but um, speaking of uh, you, throughout your career, you got you went uh, up against some great offensive linemen, like you said, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Ogden. But you got to go up against Willie Anderson in practice. What was it like going against him in practice, Willie Anderson? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, I would say this: the best thing about my whole career is that every week the best guy in the league was on my team. When I played in Kansas City, I went against Willie Rope every day. When I was in Cincinnati, I got to go up against Willie Anderson every day and Levi Jones. Um, and even in, in in Minnesota, going against Corey Fuller, I mean, uh, Corey Stringer and uh, Todd Stussy, 
It was like every every week I had a pro bowler in front of me. So I never had a week of practice where I wasn't prepared. And, you know, Willie was a great pass for pass blocker. He was a physical run dominator. And the guy was 6'7", 370 pounds. So it's not like he was never going to – you always going to get a great workout. <laughs> Um, I, I, also, I, I I forgot about Levi Jones. Like you can't forget about you can't forget about him either. That that guy was a great office alignment also in the in the NFL. Absolutely, he was feisty. And you know the the cool part is, I will say this: in Cincinnati, it was probably one of the best team wise as far as camaraderie. There was no clicks. There was no no there was no big egos. There were no big prizes in Minnesota. There was a lot of egos in that locker room. I mean, if you can imagine. You know, it was definitely the haves and the have-nots, and it was just like some guys were stratospheric, and everybody else just had to kind of find their way. But in Cincinnati, you know, even the guys that were, you know, like Corey, Corey uh, Dillon and, and Willie, who who had some individual success and some accolades, you know, it's kind of hard to carry yourself when you've been on the worst team in the NFL. So nobody, everybody had this kind of sense of humility and 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 kind of, you know, the camaraderie. Like, man, we got to stick together. We all we got. And so it was kind of easy once things started going the right direction that guys stuck together and, you know, O-linemen hung out with D-linemen and receivers hung out with cornerbacks and there were no clicks. Whereas on a lot of teams, you know, like especially like Minnesota, it was like, hey, you know, the receivers were up here and the DBs are down there. And it's just like there's this these hierarchies of, of stardom exist within these different rooms. But, you know, in Cincinnati, it was a lot of fun because it was kind of like we were all in the mud and we all came out the mud together. Yeah, so um, speaking of, uh, obviously, you mentioned Marvin Lewis, and um, I think this is an important topic that everyone should learn about, talk about minority and, uh, and coaches. Minority coaches need to get more opportunities, like Jim Caldwell. I don't know why he's still out there. He needs to get another chance. Marvin Lewis definitely needs to get another chance at NFL. And what was it like playing underneath him? What did you learn from Marvin Lewis? And what a great head coach, long-tenured Bengals coach, I think. Uh, so uh, what was it like just uh, learning from him and uh, what did he bring to the table? Well, you know, he was very professional and they were very polished. You know, when I, when I think about all the coaches that I played for as head coaches and, you know, I played for Dick Vermeil, I played for Denny Green, I played for, um, like I said, Gunther Cunningham. And, you know, I, I will say this, Marvin was very organized and he brought this kind of a level held is he wasn't an overly emotional he wasn't unemotional yeah. but he wasn't overly emotional he seemed like he always had the right temperament and you know stay calm under fire um you know maybe even you know I, well, I would say you know he was almost too cool um, <laughs> you know, so sometimes I, sometimes I felt like you know he needed to go off a little, little bit a little bit harder but you know I, I really enjoyed just kind of learning how to lead from him and you know even in, as a leader now in my own personal business you know, you kind of model after some of the people that that you that you served under, and you know, I had to work for him, especially seeing all the attitudes and personalities he had to deal with. Hmm. You know, I'm able to sit back now. You know, as a player, you know, you're so in your head, you're in the fire. You know, you have to get beat beat the crap every week. You know, you see your role, but you know, you're out there in the fire every week. <laughs> now I get to kind of pull my eyes back and sit back and see the game and be cooler, calm, and collected, and just trying to understand, like, man. How do you keep 53 guys going the same direction for 16 weeks? Because I'm like, I just think back now and I feel like, man, I was such an a-hole. I remember, you know, just times where, you know, I wasn't happy. And I remember, you know, other guys weren't happy. And, you know, just all the things that I'm sure the problems that, you know, that we created just, just you know, being in our heads about what we wanted to do, wanted to do this, and they wanted to do that, and going back and forth with coaches and you know, having those disagreements and, and having those tough conversations and having to put all that energy into constantly keeping guys doing what you want them to do versus what they want to do. And 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 now I, I just respect it so much more that, you know, those guys were able to kind of level set us and keep us focused. And, and we always managed to put together a really good package, you know, for the times that we were in the league. You know, we I think we were a very formidable team. We beat Pittsburgh. I think for the first time yeah. under under him, we beat Baltimore for the first time under him. And, you know, I think we had a really good run against Cleveland and, you know, seeing how we actually became a respectable team in the AFC North and, and, and was able to actually make him, you know, a successful head coach for a team that, that nobody thought he could turn around. Yeah, so speaking of those battles with Pittsburgh, uh, those are always interesting battles. It's still even now, it gets crazy. So what was it like? 
playing against the Steelers and uh, it gets it, especially uh, the rivalry is big time there. Oh yeah, it was nasty. I mean, let's let's just let's just let's get real. And it was and it was off the field. It was on the field. You know, there's some there were some off the field incidents. I can't even uh, talk about to this day. <laughs> where, like, listen, don't don't think we hadn't like I know guys that ran into guys at Vegas and had some hands and some some fisticuffs was exchanged oh, and, <laughs> and and you know we we've been in public settings and some words and they got exchanged and so you know there is bad blood. There, let, let, let's just go and it goes back a long time, decades. There is, there is for real bad blood, and it's not just on that battlefield. It's in the streets yeah. uh, of a few cities. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, they went down between Pittsburgh and Cincinnati players. So, um, But, you know, the, it's, it's also, you know, it's, 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 it's almost a beautiful thing because, you know, yeah. you're a part of something that is historic. You know, the, uh, that rivalry and anybody who's ever lined up on either side of it, they have a strong feeling about that other, you know, I have my strong feelings yeah. about the black and gold and, I'm sure they got their strong feelings about the black and orange, and you know it's always fun fun to reminisce about you know the wars we've had on the field, and you know if we you know the time the goes those who have been around to tell the tales and know the stories <laughs> off the field, you know we we laugh about them to this day as we become old men and just realize like <laughs> like okay yeah maybe this was just too maybe this might have went too far but it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> Can, uh, can you tell some of the stories, or you just want to keep it? <laughs> I, I, well, I, well, I got to keep it up, but I, but I, I will say there was a there was an altercation in oh, wow. in, uh, in in Vegas where you know a couple guys ran into a couple guys, and let's let's just say some tables got flipped over and chips went flying. And <laughs> you can imagine those old Bugs Bunny cartoons where you see wow. the cloud of smoke. <laughs> You see ladies and all, yeah. <laughs> you know, but uh, you know, wow. those, those were a long time ago, and, and luckily we weren't in the TNT era of, of, the, of, of the game, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad there's probably no film of that. But it, it's kind of funny now to think that you know it'd be a whole different ball game in right. this environment. But back yeah. then, you know, sometimes, sometimes on a bye week, if guys ran into each other or oh my guys see each other in the grocery <laughs> store. Yeah, it might it might pop off because we were, you know we we were for real, man. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what would you say as a Bengal? Uh, what were your some your some of your best moments as a Cincinnati Cincinnati Bengal and uh, playing in front of those fans? Um, okay. Oh, you know the one well, year we won the AFC North against Detroit. Um, I think was it two thousand three? I think. Uh, well, you remember the year that Carson Palmer ended up injuring his leg? Oh, yes. The yeah. year that Pittsburgh ended up winning the Super Bowl. That was supposed to be our Super Bowl. And a lot of people don't realize we had, we had already swept Pittsburgh. We had beat Pittsburgh at Pittsburgh. Right. We were beating them that last game of the season until Carson broke his leg. And had we not had an altercation in the locker room, we probably would have won that game. Hmm. But, you know, them beating us basically ended up catapulting them into the playoffs and then they ended up going on a historic run. But that year, you know, I, I kind of felt like, man, if Carson wouldn't have hurt his leg, we were a special team. I, I felt like that was our year to to kind of make that statement. I think we would have had a great shot at, at making a run. Yeah, so so moving forward to your career, um, how did the – obviously you played in the Canadian Football League too, and uh, how did that come about? And what was that, uh, what was that experience like for you? <laughs> um, that was just me probably – not not sure if I had any football left in me. Wanted to see wanted to see if there was still a little bit of want to to in the tank, and you know, quickly finding out that you know the Canadian Football League is a far cry from the NFL. And if I was gonna play football anymore, it probably would be there. It was like it, it was kind of cool to see how another level of football does it, but it was a way too far of a step back. You know, kind of reminded me of going back to high school ball. Almost, except for I guess you do get like they do get a paycheck, but you know, the, the environment was like, man, uh, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I, I respect those guys completely, but I, I just remember feeling like, man, this is a totally different environment than the NFL. I think if I'm gonna move to Canada and freeze my butt off, it's got to be more, <laughs> you know, it, it's got to be able to offer me more than what the Canadian league, league could could do for me at this point in my career. So I just quickly uh, declined and, and went back home and. Said, hey, I just, I'm glad I got to see it up close and personal for a couple of days. <laughs> <clears throat> did, you, did you ever think to, uh, before, did you ever think to, you know, maybe I, I could have played one more year in the NFL? Did any other NFL teams look at you at that point? Um, I, I didn't want to play anymore. You know, 
I got to that point where, you know, my last season, you know when you know, you know, and I don't know if, if you've ever heard anybody tell stories, just, you know, you just wake up and it's time to go to training camp and you're yeah. just like, I don't really want to do this no more. <laughs> and, you know, like I felt like I kind of gutted out my last year, but, right. you know, there was definitely no doubt that I was, I was, if anything, I think if you were allowed to take a break, you know, maybe I just wanted to take a year off, but I think anytime you bang, you know, a decade straight and you've had, you know, I think I've had 12 orthopedic surgeries, you know, mm-hmm. you know, at some point you just got to start thinking about, hey, am I going to be able to walk when I'm 50? Am I, you know, are my faculties going to be <laughs> where they should be, you know, at a certain point. And so I know for me, it wasn't a, it wasn't no doubt in my mind that I was ready to, ready to be done with football and I had, had, had given it all I had. Yeah. So now uh, looking back, you looking back at your career, you, you had a great career. In my opinion, you had over 50 sacks, over 345 tackles, and you you you, know, you played with great teams, great uh, coaches. Well, uh, how great are you to be in this position to play to be able to play the game you love, uh, make your family proud, get drafted, have a good have a great career? And uh, do you believe you do you deserve to be in the Hall of Fame? Because to be honest, the, the stats the, the stats does not matter for me. I. I I know they do believe in the numbers, but in my opinion, for for players to, I feel like they need to go about how they performed on the field and what they brought to the game. So, how do you feel about your career? Absolutely, I'm very proud of my career, very grateful for my career. But you know, in all in all graciousness, now I don't feel like I was Hall of Fame. Um, I, I played with Hall of Fame, and I, I definitely you know been out there. Guys like John Randall, guys like Chris Goldman. You know, I, you know, even me having 10 years, that's a great career. But, you know, those guys played 15, 16 years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they put up even bigger numbers. And so, uh, you know, I, I will say that I, I stood shoulder to shoulder with those guys. I competed with those guys, went to war with those guys. But I'll say those guys had better careers than me. And, and you know, they, they definitely deserve all those accolades. You know, if I would have had maybe five more years and maybe 50 more sacks, you know, I could, I could make an argument. But right. I, I no, I didn't. Unfortunately, I got injured and I had had my moments where I was on that trajectory. Probably at the peak of my career, I, you know, I broke my pelvis and then I had a knee injury and probably missed out on some some opportunities to really set my career on a new direction. But you know, I'm grateful for for everything that I did and I'm, I'm very proud of my career. And I know I was definitely one of the better players out that that played in the league. But uh, no, nah, I don't think I belong in that conversation for the Hall of Fame. I mean, I think I, I think we do. Uh, we we believe that you deserve it. So. Thank you, though. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So now, uh, look, after your NFL career, now you're helping out the uh, younger people, and also you have this program called Urbana Spine and Wellness, and I looked at it. It's amazing, amazing what you guys are doing. So, how did that come about, and what's it like helping helping out the people now? Um, so kind of like what I was saying during the like my fifth year in the league, I broke my pelvis and I just signed that $35 million contract with Kansas City and I was really on my way. But after breaking my pelvis, I played hurt. And for 12 games, I played hurt. And I ended by the end of the season, I had a I had a ruptured platella in my knee. So it's like my career quickly kind of spiraled. I ended up basically addicted to Percocets and Vicodin and I was getting shot up with Toradol and I was just went through this three-year cycle of my career where instead of enjoying the fruits of my labor and, and progressing, I was getting surgery at the surgery to repair my hip, to repair my knee. And, and after about two seasons of doing that, I was basically taking a cocktail of drugs every single day just so I could get off the crutches and go play. And, you know, it, it really took a lot of things away from me. It took away a lot of my joy for the game. And it, it really changed, you know, because that's when you start to really understand I'm destroying my body for money. And that was probably the hardest part of this game is to get to that point where like, okay, I'm making big money, but now the expectation is I got to play hurt. I got to play come hell or high water. I got to perform and play hurt come right. hell or high water for this, for this kind of money. And so along with that, with that pain, I, I ended up enduring 12 orthopedic surgeries to repair it and, you know, went through a divorce. And, you know, when you, when you, when you kind of go through all these <laughs> things, you start to kind of go back and put the pieces together what went wrong. And what I realized is, you know, using drugs and using surgery to take care of my body was was a losing program. That was like the worst possible, only the worst possible things that happened. Every time I had one surgery, I needed another surgery. I had more scar tissue. I had more, then I needed more narcotics, more anti-inflammatories, more painkillers. So I started going to holistic practitioners and 
and using hella workers and acupuncturists and, and people who specialized in non-invasive drug-free healthcare. And then I started researching technology, uh, spinal decompression, cold lasers, um, neuromed. And as I got more and more educated, I, I began to realize there was a whole world of healthcare out there that's not even, even us as the NFL players at the time, we were, begin, were giving standard care, which is drugs and surgery drugs, and a few rudimentary, you know, PT treatments, ionopresis, ice packs, heat packs, you know, but that stuff was nowhere near the level of what we could have been getting. So I invested probably 200 grand of my own money and basically built my own facility at my house at the time. And I basically began to get trained by every practitioner and every technology that I could find that had anything to do with non-invasive drug-free healthcare. And I basically got off of drugs. I basically stopped taking painkillers. I never went to the training room anymore. I stopped going to the team doctors. And I basically created my own non-invasive drug wellness center in my house. And then all my teammates started coming to me. And then the team started getting mad. Like, hey, Dwayne, nobody's coming to the locker room. Nobody's coming to the trainers. And guys were coming to me. And they were getting better. And guys weren't getting it. And then most importantly, I started working with people like Mark Versteeg and, and athletes performers. And I learned, started learning prehabilitation and guys stopped getting injured because that was the biggest issue. It was like our team was always talented, but we had so many guys banging up all the time. It was just because it's like we didn't really have a, 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 the, the synergy of technology and holistic healthcare to prehabilitate our bodies to keep ourselves ready to go. It's like buying a bunch of Ferraris, but you're taking them to Jiffy Lube to keep them on the field. Right. You know, and, and that's basically what the level of care. And so now, what I did was just took everything that I learned throughout my career to keep myself completely uninjured, to keep myself off the operating table, to keep myself from having to take drugs and narcotics. I take all that stuff and I just build my own facility. And I had my first one in Silver Spring and now I have one in Urbana, Maryland. And basically that's what we're trying to do is like basically take people out of this standard loop of standard care. Where you go to a doctor, he looks at you for 15 minutes, you tell him your knee hurts, he gives you an inflammatory, come back in six weeks. Oh, you need to hurt, so I'll give you a narcotic. Come back in six weeks. Okay, well, now go to PT for 30 visits. Okay, now we'll do an MRI. Oh, yeah, maybe you need surgery. But it's just like, you know, I've, I've wasted nine months of my life, and I've gotten nowhere, whereas now we're coming in, we're saying, no, we're going to treat treat everybody like a high-end athlete, like, right. like a physical specimen should be. You come in, you tell me your knee hurts, I'm going to look at your knee, I'm going to look at your hip, I'm going to look at your ankle, I'm going to look at the entire kinetic chain, and I'm going to go ahead and make everything I'm going to look at everything that's, that could be possibly going on. And I'm going to basically start correcting from the top down and the bottom up. And then you're going to get long, long lasting full, full time relief. And that's what it should be about, you know, not just, you know, trying to get you in and out for visit after visit, copay after copay. And then I'm hoping at the end of the day, I get to do a long term surgery that's going to give me, you know, a six figure payout, you know, by the time everybody gets involved. Sorry about that. My dog's in here. <laughs> yeah, about I mean, that Kiwi, stop. Yes. Night. Yeah, but um, that's awesome what you're doing there. Keep it up. And uh, if you guys need help with anything with promoting stuff, we can help promote stuff on our stories. If oh, you... definitely. I would love yeah. to do that. And also, how so you guys and also people can people can I, I've seen uh, people can work out your in your facility, right? People can work. Yeah. Out. So so one of the best things about my facility is we're kind of set up to go from prehabilitation to full workouts to rehabilitation. So we're kind of covered the gamut. Once you're out of pain and you're actually fully functional, we want to actually make you strong. We, we improve your balance, your coordination, your body control. And we have really high tech equipment that no other facility has for that because we, like I said, we try to basically train everybody like they're a high end athlete. Right. So when you think about what LeBron James or Tom Brady yeah. would do versus, and even when you see what regular athletes are doing versus them, why are those guys able to play at such a high level? It's because they're investing in the best technology. I guarantee you they're using the best technology the best practitioners and the best wellness techniques to keep their body constantly at that state of readiness where they're prehabilitated. And the same thing, the same kind of health care should be available to everybody, but we're basically making it available and affordable to the, to the general public, even if insurance and stuff doesn't cover it. Yeah. So uh, like I said, um, if you want to send us, uh, if you want to send me some stuff and then uh, I can have my team put your stuff on our stories and help promote it too. So. Oh, thank you. I would love to do that. Yeah, so the next thing here, I want to go back to the Larry Fitzgerald story you told me before. So uh, whenever you see him in person or connect with him, do you, do you ever bring that story back up to him? Uh, which story you said? The Larry Fitzgerald story when he cleaned Oh, yeah. Do you, ever, do you ever bring that story back up to him and you see him? 
<laughs> well, the last time I ran into him, we were at the Arnold Classic in Cleveland. And um, I think he was there doing a promotion for like, I don't know, a, a, a supplement line or something. And so, you know, of course, he ran to me. We say, said, what's up? But yeah, we had a good laugh about it. But I haven't <laughs> seen him in, in, in about 10 years. But yeah, the last time I saw him, he was still playing for Arizona. And we laughed about, yeah, man, I still remember you watching my whip, man. You did a great <laughs> job. He's like, man, that was so cool. Because, you know, at the time, it was like, I don't know how many 17-year-olds, but that car was probably worth about 100 grand. Yeah. You know, between, it was brand new. It was like, the, it was a matter of fact, it was the first Lincoln Navigator that that dealership had ever gotten. <laughs> with the custom rims and the custom stereo. The whole time I was in training camp, I basically let him drive it the whole 28 days we were in camp. And so he was the man rolling around town. So oh, wow, that's crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. so a couple more things here before I let you go. Um, this is a two-part question. And what are your thoughts so far on this NFL season? Is It's coming to an end quickly with the playoffs coming up. And they added a, an extra game to the Week 17 schedule now. And what are your thoughts? And uh, what do you like about it? And uh, the next part to this question, uh, who is your favorite defensive player to watch right now? <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm a big Chiefs fan. That's the team. I actually still do some work with the organization. We, we're part, part of the Chiefs Ambassadors, and um, we do a community service, and we do a lot of outreach. So I'm always rooting for my Chiefs, number one. Chris Jones is definitely my favorite player to watch. He dominates up front. He uh, kind of reminds me of myself. I, I like the way that man gets down. Um, and obviously, I'm happy that the results have turned in our favor and, you know, we're back on top and in control of our own destiny and literally just having to win out to, to, to get the season done. Um, I forgot there was three questions there. What oh, was the other two? Oh, yeah. The, first, uh, the other one was uh, what are your thoughts on, on, on the uh, season so far overall? Uh, well, you know, it's, it's, it's getting interesting. I, I feel like it's been a great season competitive wise. I mean, I've seen more great games, more close games. I think from a fan standpoint, you know, I, I couldn't be happier with how close they are. Obviously, like like other people, the officiating has always been a little bit rough, you know, trying to get some consistency and clarity, especially for the defensive player. What is pass interference? What is rough in the passer? You know, it just seems like there's so many opportunities for the game to get affected, you know, in a negative way by by a judgment call. And, you know, that that's probably been the biggest issue that I've seen. And then Obviously, we're dealing with this COVID and COVID issue and yeah. trying to figure out how do you keep moving forward having games. And, you know, I think our reality is, and I'm not a doctor, I'm in the medical field, but, you know, I, I don't see COVID as something that's going anywhere. I feel like, you know, at a certain point, yeah, everybody's going to have to kind of deal with the fact that people are going to have COVID. Some people are going to have symptoms, some people are not. If players aren't having symptoms, I feel like at this point, you know, we, we just got to kind of keep playing and, and and just deal with the fact that people are going to keep testing positive for COVID no right. matter what. And just deal with the people who are having symptoms and understand, hopefully, if they're vaccinated, that they're not going to have severe symptoms. But, you know, deal with the symptoms, that the people who are symptomatic. But, you know, at some point, we just kind of got to let it go on that, that, you know, I think, you know, the fact that people are testing positive shouldn't shouldn't affect their playing status. It should be like, hey, are they symptomatic? Are they are they are they actually having ill effects? Because you know, it just it doesn't seem to really right. have any rhyme or reason, and it just doesn't seem like we can keep moving forward and have a season if if we keep basically pulling everybody just because they have some antibodies and whether they're being affected by them or not. Yeah. So um, I'm just curious. Um, so Le Leonard Marshall told me that he misses the game, the era when he played in, like uh, with Lawrence Taylor and all. So do you miss that type of game when you played in the the, the era where you could hit hard and get away with the flags? Absolutely. You know, uh, it, it's it's kind of a double-edged sword. You know, I'm a father now. And so, you know, I do realize, hey, I did things that I wouldn't want my kids to do. And I do want the game to be safer. I do want guys to have a quality of life after the game. And I do see that, you know, the way we played, we played it the way it was most meant to be played. It was a war and we played yeah. for blood. But I can also see the the downside of it is like, you know, it was more entertaining. The game was for real and it, it was definitely a, a real live battle and it was more vicious, but then there was a lot more casualties. And so I'm not against the game becoming safer. I'm not against the game, right. you know, leaving people in better shape than, than, than what we were, that we were left in. Um, obviously with the helmet safety and with some of the rule changes, I, I did feel like, you know, we had to see this progression coming at some point. 
if, if we want to see the, the kind of the tragic end to a lot of football players' lives stop happening. But, you know, I'm proud to say I played in the era before, you know, the game was safe. And, you know, I kind of kind of feel like we deserve a little bit of an asterisk by our name because, you know, you know, we played the game when it was a blood sport. You know, the game is still a, a vicious game and it's still a tough game, but it's definitely not as bad as the game that we played. But at the same time, I'm also glad that these guys are going to have a better quality of life. And yeah. I don't want the game to go away and people to stop letting their kids play because the game is so bad, so hard on the body and they do see – Tragedy after tragedy. Obviously, I don't want to see guys getting CTE and, mm-hmm. and losing their faculties, or you know, not able to function physically. On you know, just because you know the game is more entertaining that way. Yeah. So, um, so before we get to the last two things, um, obviously, um, we we, uh, we lost someone recently, Demarius Thomas, former NFL receiver. And what are your thoughts? What, if you watched him play, what what was your thoughts on him and his legacy? Oh, man, he was a great guy. You know, I, I didn't know him personally, but I definitely watched a lot of games for being a Chiefs fan. And, you know, he was a hell of a competitor. And obviously, you know, the heart goes out to him and his family. And, you know, it's a tragedy for the whole league. Somebody so young. And, you know, just kind of lets us know, you know, you know, our bodies and disease. And, you know, we have to, you know, try to fight as hard as we can to be as vigilant. And like I was saying, with prehabilitation, you know, hopefully guys are, you know, getting diagnosed and getting checked and, Mm-hmm. And, you know, hopefully finding out and getting in the best treatment they possibly can as soon as they possibly can so so guys don't end up losing their lives so early. Yeah, so um, I want to ask you this. So I'm a I'm a big Dallas Cowboy fan, and uh, we have a player uh, named Micah Parsons. What do you think of him so far? He's putting up numbers, and they they already compared him to Lawrence Taylor, but it's too early. Yeah, you. Uh, I hope they don't jinx him. You know, that's the only problem, like – He's a great player, obviously a phenom. I would love to have him on the Chiefs. Um, but, you know, obviously one year is one year. And, you know, it takes a lot to put together a career of greatness. Um, so, you know, I'm looking forward to watching him play for a long time. And hopefully he continues to have this, this great success. Um, but like I said, you know, the first year is, you know, sometimes the, the hardest part about having great success your first year is right. it's almost nowhere, to go, nowhere else to go but yeah. down. So, I'm always a little weary, you know, sometimes when everything happens so good right out the gate that, you know, that that that's, that becomes a, a, a kind of a slippery slope that you have to exist on because it's like, how do you top that when, you know, you have such a phenomenal first year and now everybody's looking for you and it just becomes harder and harder to, to, to get the opportunities to make those great plays like you did the first time when nobody was looking at you. Yeah. So the last two things here, um, our team is part of this foundation. It's called the Hugh Jackson Foundation. He's a former NFL coach. Um, now he, was, he used to be the offensive coordinator with Eddie George at Tennessee State. And now he's the head coach for Grambling State University. And we're trying to help him prevent human trafficking, making sure the com- community stays safe, the kids stay safe. So we'll send you the foundation so you can go check it out. Uh, thank you. Love support that. Yeah, so in the last thing here, uh, would you like to say anything to all the nurses, doctors, and all the essential workers right now? Absolutely. Thank you guys for all that you guys do every day. Um, I'm, I'm quasi in the healthcare field. I'm not on the front lines like you guys, but I definitely understand how dangerous it is and, and how painful it is that you guys, you guys are being exposed to things and having to deal with people who aren't being responsible and, and you're trying to take care of them better than they take care of themselves. But I appreciate you guys and I hope nothing but God, God willing the best for you and have a happy holiday and happy new year. Yeah, well said. And there it is. That wraps up episode 950 with former California NFL defense end Dwayne Clemens. He's now the co-founder of Urbana Spine and Wellness. Go check that out. He's doing great things with that program. And he also played with the Vikings, Chiefs, Bengals. He played in the Canadian Football League. What a great career. Over 50 sacks, over 345 tackles. Uh, man, this guy does it all. But uh, thank you again for coming on the show, Dwayne. It was truly an honor. Get to learn more about your story. Uh, keep up the great work and we would love to have you back on the show down the line so you can meet the full team but uh, thank you again this is truly an honor and uh, I learned a lot from this and uh, stay safe happy holidays to you and your family and happy new year thank you and the same to you guys looking forward thank to meeting you. you guys next time the whole team yeah thank you all right have a good one